<laughs> okay, recording in progress. I'm, I'm recording. So, yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, it's nice to be here. Um, uh, and also, of course, a special greetings, a greeting to uh, our your, the people in, in uh, the Ukraine. Uh, can see them right now, but uh, I imagine uh, this kind of workshop is a little bit uh, taking a break from all this mess around you, and I will do my best uh, to keep you distracted and entertained <laughs> by, by talking about um, our yeah, some of our pressure independent studies that we have done uh, uh, in the last two years, I would say, or more. Maybe. Good. So before I start, uh -huh. here. Yes. Okay. Um, I would like to introduce the people involved. So there's a team of people um, at the Technical University. I should mention Clirin, who did a lot of the crystallography. I am going to show you then Tobias as well, Marijn Rahn and Fabian Stier. Then we have a very good cooperation with the ESIF. ESIF. Um, and this is not really working well. Theory. <laughs> so I will, the theory people are there in the back. So I will show you all, also a few, um, a few results from theory, which I find very interesting myself. And I, I hope I can explain them correctly. And if not, then they'll leave you and uh, come in the back and they can help you. Good. And then of course, nothing uh, you can, uh, guys like me, we can, cannot do anything without good samples. And uh, yeah, I'm also very grateful that we have these people providing samples for us that we could study with our methods. Okay. So, um, already as most is a take-home message of this talk what i want to show you are two examples essentially which uh, demonstrate that if you do in fact high pressure x-ray diffraction uh, in combination with theory uh, there's a lot yet that you can learn about interacting electron systems and i actually was surprised myself when i saw this and uh, i want to show you how that works and it has to do mostly with the fact that there have been really uh, a lot of development recently First of all, in this high pressure X-ray diffraction or X-ray diffraction in general, there's been a lot of progress, and I would also say in theory, so in, in the way how people model many body effects in, uh, in, in these electron systems has improved a lot. And um, the two things together are powerful, and I want to illustrate this with these two examples. So the example number one um, is uh, about localized spins, so localized electrons, if you want sitting on frustrated lattices. I will explain in a second what that means. And as Dima already said, so I will be talking mostly about ruthenium trichloride uh, because we have quite nice results there, which we try to publish uh, desperately, but uh, yeah, that takes time. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, the second example, if I still have time, um, but I, I would like to show you also something related to itinerant electrons on frustrated lattices. So now the electrons can move around. And uh, this is a little bit of a different situation. It's also interesting, and I want to show you what we can learn there from our type of approach. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, I imagine uh, most of you have already heard this introduction to uh, frustrated magnetism many times, so I can probably go fast. If I'm too fast, please interrupt. Um, so the idea is, of course, if you have incompatible uh, interactions here, like the antiferromagnetically coupled easing spins on a triangle, uh, you cannot satisfy all the bonds at once, and uh, you create something that's what we call frustration. Um, then, of course, uh, an idea is what, what happens if you, if you take a lot of these triangles and form a lattice, for instance, in two dimensions, I form a two-dimensional lattice. Uh, what will I get then? Will I still get frustration? And uh, there was, you know, 50, more than 50 years ago, this paper by uh, Philip Anderson, um, where he came up with a resonating valence bond idea which in fact was the first uh, quantum spin liquid that has been proposed. And um, yeah, so what is the resonating valence bond idea anyway? So maybe very quickly I can uh, walk you through this uh, if you're not familiar with this. Uh, so here you see I, I write this like a resonating valence bond quantum state. So it's really a quantum state. And uh, what you see here are these little cigars and um, uh, below the cigars, I hope you can see that there is this triangular lattice, which I was showing in the beginning. And now uh, every cigar essentially represents a spin singlet. And every spin singlet is a superposition you know, of uh, spin up and down combinations uh, of the two sides. Um, so that means, in fact, you cannot assign any spin to a certain side in the state so, because there's a very strong entanglement. 
And now um, this is called a, re a valence bond. And now you can put these valence bonds, you can form many of them in the triangular lattice in different ways onto the triangular, onto this triangular lattice. Yeah? So one possibility would be this. I could also have another, could choose another possibility of decoration like that and so on and so forth. And the point is that all these different decorations, if you want, they all have the same energy. So uh, in the extreme case of a resonating valence bond state, you have at a zero temperature, all these possibilities are superimposed and you have a very strong entanglement of the spins, yet there's no ordering of spins that you can detect, um, even though you might have very strong couplings between, between two neighboring spins. Yeah? And that's a very intriguing um, state. It actually turned out later, um, and people were interested in this for, for, for several reasons. I come to this in a second. Um, it turned out then if you take, for instance, not an easing type of interaction, but an, an Heisenberg interaction on this triangular lattice that doesn't have a, a quantum spin liquid ground state like Anderson uh, uh, proposed, it has an ordered state. So um, there you can already kind of uh, see that if you have Heisenberg interactions, they are not so good for quantum spin liquids actually, because the spins have too many ways they can orient. And uh, so then the system might find a funny way an order at low temperatures to escape the frustration. Um, if you take these, uh, this freedom away of the spins of oriented anywhere in space and you introduce anisotropies, then you might have a better chance. And as you will see uh, in the following, that actually is what happens in, in many of these systems. So, and then anyway, see, it turned out a triangular lattice, Heisenberg, uh, antiferromagnet is not uh, a quantum spin liquid type state. So, zero efficiency started to search around and they looked at different kind of lattices, like uh, related to the, to the triangular lattice, the Kagumi lattice or the Honeycomb lattice. Uh, these are the examples of frustrated lattices I will talk about today. And uh, then you probably all know that then Kitaev at some point came out uh, with this very interesting um, model, which now bears his name, uh, which is the Kitaev model. It's a model on a Honeycomb lattice. And uh, now you will see that there the anisotropy of the magnetic interactions is very important. And uh, yeah, I, I have an example here. So let's let's look at this. This is the honeycomb lattice here. Yeah, and I try to kind of point with the mouse to this number one. So there's a spin, a pseudo spin or whatever, the spin object is with, a, with a quantum number one half. And now you know uh, you have the green component along the green direction is coupled coupled along this green bond towards the neighbor. And this bond wants to make these two components ferromagnetic, this one and this one. Yeah. And uh, then you have another bond of side one to the neighbor along, we call it Y. And now this, this, this bond wants to make these blue uh, spin components parallel. parallel. Yeah. And then there's a third one uh, where if I go this direction, I want to couple the red spin components um, parallel. And now you can see that I cannot fulfill all these conditions at once. Um, so I cannot, uh, the spin cannot point in all three directions at the same time. So you get a, a typical frustration uh, situation. And again, you know, you see here what I was, uh, if you think back to the picture with the cigars, um, here we have cigars again, now they are triplets. So you have your ferromagnetic bonds and they decorate, if you like, now the honeycomb lattice. And again, I have many ways how I can do this uh, um, decoration. And in the extreme case at uh, zero temperature, I would have, say, all these things superimposed into one big quantum state. And the uh, interesting point here was that this model, it's written down here. So you see again, so there's, this is the Kitaev interaction. I come to this again. And there we have the spins with the different components, X, Y, Z. They are coupled through easing type interactions, not Heisenberg, easing. And it turns out that this is an exactly solvable model. Uh, it is a topological spin liquid. Uh, has a topological spin liquid ground state where you have local fluxes and mobile Majorana fermions and whatnot. And uh, that's an interesting and fractionalized excitations, um, uh, which are interesting. And in particular, people are thinking about uh, can we maybe build uh, a topological quantum computer out of this kind of object? Um, that would be the application, the aspect of application. I'm not so much into the application. I'm more interested uh, in trying to find a material platform that actually realizes these kind of physics. So people started to think, can we find this in the real material? And um, then as uh, the next, I would say, breakthrough was when uh, here, these guys, uh, Shaluka, Jackie Kayulin, uh, came up with this idea that if you take 
a 4D or 5D transition metal with five electrons in the D shell and you place it into a cubic uh, crystal field, um, you all know, and it splits up in T2G and EG levels. Sp uh, splitting is very large. You still have one hole here sitting in the T2G shell. Then I go into the whole picture. So this is now representing this hole in the T2G shell. And then, uh, of course, uh, the T2Gs are three orbitals. You can think, okay, that's very similar to p orbitals with l equal one. So this is like uh, having an effective moment of uh, orbital moment of one. And now you couple the spin of the whole parallel or anti-parallel to that orbital moment, and you get a state with j one half or three half. And in the ground state, the whole would be sitting here in this um, j one half state. And um, here, this is just to show you that this is a spin orbit entangled state where you superimpose different orbital components and different spin components. Uh, and this is a very funny object that is the basis of what has been proposed by Shalupka, Yakin, and Kalunin. And um, the idea is the following. If I now take, for instance, uh, I take the super exchange picture here, and I have here, this would be my transition metal, one here, one over here, with this kind of a, a state. Um, then if this is cubic, uh, that means that this side here, this, this picture is valid and I have nice J1 half states. It turns out that if the angle is really precisely 90 degree in the super exchange model, I have a very nice situation that the Heisenberg exchange, which is harmful for the quantum spin liquid goes away. And what, the only thing that is left is the guitar interaction. Yeah, but we have certain conditions. So these are very strict conditions here. M, L, L, so this means a metal, sorry, metal, ligand, metal, angle is 90 degree, and the state must be this funny J1 half object uh, so on here. Okay, and then you can consider as an idea for materials design. So now if we look at in, into really materials, which realizes we want to have, you know, no splitting of the T2G shell, and in the best case, precisely 90 degree bond angle. That's what we try to find. Yeah? Um, so, and um, now I'm coming to uh, the alpha rosinium trichloride. So, if you do alpha rosinium trichloride, you have these octahedra sharing edges, uh, very similar to what I showed on the previous slide. However, they are slight distortions. Yeah? So, these systems are not perfect. So, the octahedra are a little bit compressed. So, they're not really cubic. So, there might be a small splitting of the T2G levels. Uh, you have here, uh, I have a, an illustration. So you see the bond lengths of the honeycomb lattice are a little bit distorted. They are not always the same. Bond angle is quite far from 90 degree. So that's not ideal for this key type system if you think of the super exchange picture, yeah? because we want the angle to be 90. Good. And as a result, uh, what you have from these distortions is that you bring into play additional interactions. So we would, would like to have this guy. But now, because the system is slightly distorted, we can have all kinds of things like the Heisenberg interaction becomes larger, and the off diagonal exchange interactions become larger. There might be nearest neighbor, next nearest neighbor interactions, and maybe deviations from this very nice J1 half wave function. Uh, so you see, and as a result, it's maybe not so surprising that the system at ambient conditions, if you, uh, ambient pressure, if you cool it down, shows magnetic order and not a quantum spin liquid state. Okay, and our very um, naive idea um, quite some years back was, okay, what if we can experimentally tune the structure into a high symmetry phase? Uh, can we do this? Fine tuning of the lattice structure. Uh, and our, uh, my, 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 my naive idea was simply, okay, I take hydrostatic pressure, I push from all sides hydrostatically, and then maybe the system goes uh, by itself into a nice, Cubic, very high symmetry structure. And then, we, uh, when, since I'm here in Dresden, I have been very busy with setting up the instrument. So, a little uh, advertisement. Uh, by now, this is working really very nicely. So, we have a high pressure lab. So, there's a, a diffractometer. If you are interested, you can come and visit us and I can show you uh, for the people here in Dresden. And uh, anyway, and everybody's welcome. Um, uh, it's actually a very nice instrument. Uh, you know, you see here we have. Uh, uh, Light source with optics. That's already, you know, I was mentioning these advancement advancements that have been done. And we have a cryostat here, which has essentially no vibrations, very little vibrations, and a super sensitive detector, very nice diffractometer, and so on and so forth. And uh, if you want to do high pressure, you know, you have your samples here. You see a sample <laughs> in a pressure cell, and this here is a ruby. We always use the ruby to uh, monitor the pressure inside the sample volume. So um, we have to check what is the pressure inside. So we have an in situ monitor that's a ruby. 
Um, but if you want to do these experiments, you also need a lot of you know um, facilities around. So we have also this high pressure um, lab where we have a laser cutter. Now on Monday, a helium loader just arrived, um, which enables us to load the sample space inside the pressure cell with helium. It's the best you can do. And that's important because we want to study layered materials. And uh, then it's not good to have non-hydrostatic conditions because you really screw up your material and, uh, and, and not, cannot measure it anyway. So yeah, you see we, we take this very seriously and uh, just a little advertisement in case you have an idea, a nice crystal where you think, okay, that could be interesting to measure under high pressure. Yeah, come to me and, uh, and we can do it. Okay, so now uh, let's go to the measurements I want to talk about. So this is, you can find on the archive. Um, there for quite some time. It's one of the earlier versions. Now there's a more advanced, what uh, advanced version, but you can find all the details. It's different of what I'm going to show. So I already said um, uh, I want to talk about the helium trichloride. Here you see the honeycomb layers. They are supposed to be uh, a Kitaev type system, slightly distorted. This is how we do it. So here again, so you saw a picture. So here's a sample. There's a ruby. We put this between two diamond anvils. All this together goes into a certain housing. And uh, then we kind of can apply force and pressure and the beam comes in from this side and we measure in transmission and we go through this sample and we have an, a nice detector on the other side detecting the reflected intensities. Okay, so that is uh, the thing what we do. We can do it at room temperature, low temperature, so on. So now what did we get? So in the very beginning, there was a study we did together uh, with Gael and, and Bernd's group. Uh, we started, and um, so you here see a phase diagram. So this is the pressure here. This is the temperature. Usually, I mean, yeah. So at uh, the ambient conditions, the system is a monoclinic, uh, has a monoclinic structure, a slight distortion um, at ambient pressure. And uh, what we found uh, in this first study was a bit uh, disappointing because when we applied pressure, it turned out we didn't go into something like a quantum spin liquid, but we formed a diamond, dimerized state. So we always get into this blue phase here, and this is uh, really showing very strong dimers. And um, so, uh, yeah, I'll leave you and his uh, people, they calculated what the wave functions look like. And you can see already here, there's a direct overlap between the naval and neocidium sites that kind of stabilizes this covalent bond between the two. And so the dimers are uh, there and form, and they are super stable, and I think, uh, it sits there forever when you apply pressure, have a higher pressure. So, um, so that's not what we need uh, in case of uh, uh, you know um, the quantum spin liquid. So, in the quantum spin liquid, we don't do not want to have these dimers like crystallizing out on the lattice. We want to have this uh, superposition of different possibilities. So that is uh, a problem. Uh, but then we decided to look a bit more carefully at the evolution of the system when we increase pressure. And you see, we start from something green and then there's this yellow stuff <laughs> and we go into the blue phase. And that's what I'm going to talk about, the yellow stuff here. So I want to tell you what's happening in the yellow region. And that's actually quite interesting, but you have to really very carefully measure this. Um, so um, a few things you can see directly by looking at the raw data, so without any um, further big analysis, and it's kind of interesting. So uh, crystallography can be very nice. Um, so we have, I will show you now like uh, three different families of reflections. And uh, one representative of family number one is a zero L three L streak. So here you see L, this is um, around K equals three. And you see here are peaks. Uh, there's a little bit of some powder stuff around, but don't worry too much about this because it's uh, probably a logarithm. I think it's logarithmic anyways. So there are peaks. And then we increase the, um, the pressure to 1.26 GPA. And what you see is quite boring. Huh? So this, uh, these peaks, they don't really change. Nothing changes. Actually, they get sharper. It's kind of funny that you apply pressure and the structure gets better. If you are very careful with the pressure, it actually can happen. Okay, so this is a more boring family. Now let's look at a more interesting family. So that's family number three, uh, two, two, family number two. Uh, it starts out with here now relatively sharp peaks. We increase uh, centered here at this point. By the way, don't, don't worry about the L coordinates. That has to do with our setting that we are using. I'm, uh, just, just look at the intensity distribution, not at the value of the L. Um, but you will see first we start out with a, with a relatively sharp peak. 
Then we apply pressure, it gets really broad, broader, 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 and then it shifts and it gets sharp again. So then uh, you can already see that the structure goes somehow from something that is ordered, this part of the structure that we are probing with this family is first ordered, gets disordered, and then orders again in a different way because the peak shifts a little. Okay, and then we have another family, family number, number three now, um, where we start out with something really broad. We, uh, it has a center maybe here at zero. We increase the pressure It kind of the center. You can see that the center is changing, mm -hmm. but it remains broad. So you see we have all kinds of substructures. Some substructures are always ordered. Some substructures go from one order through a disordered phase into something ordered. And then we have another substructure that goes mostly is always disordered. And for crystallography, this is a, a nightmare because that's very hard to analyze. So partially disordered structures are not so easy to tackle. Um, however, um, I have the citation here, that's bad. Uh, so um, Müller and Conradi, so there was a, these are people doing crystallography very seriously, they found out that uh, if you look at family two, what it tells you is that this shift in position uh, from here to there means that the close packing of the chlorine is changing. And that in a sense means that you have like a sliding of these uh, ruthenium uh, chlorine trilayer. So they kind of slide from one configuration to another one. Uh, that means that's a chlorine configuration rejection. And then you have family number three, and that has to do with the stacking. So this is probing the stacking of the ruthenium honeycomb layers. And these remain always kind of disordered with a lot of stacking faults. Uh, um, there's some change in the order, but they all mostly remain uh, disordered. And that has to do with the fact that for a fixed position of the chlorine atoms, you have still different choices where you put the ruthenium. So you can put the ruthenium layers a little bit around without disturbing uh, the chlorine. Anyway, okay. So, so, so yeah. What's the difference between family one, two, and three? How that works? So in principle, it's like this. So you have uh, a structure factor. And uh, so not all the atoms are contributing to all the, to these peaks. So if I go to family number one, there's only certain atoms that contribute and also certain coordinates. And then I go to family number two, it's probably a different subset of so now the chlorides. And then I go to another HKL composition and I probe uh, the ruthenium honeycomb layers. It's actually funny that this works, but this, these are the interference effects which you have in the structure vector. So that's uh, kind of nice. So, um, Okay, uh, this, this is interesting, but then the question is, of course, is there anything more we can learn from the diffraction? And um, uh, yes, we can, but it means that we have to do a structural refinement of a disordered structure, and that, that's not so easy. And actually, it's not totally disordered, it's partially disordered. So uh, I tell you, it's not so, so straightforward, but nowadays it actually works. And the thing is that we can measure these big um, intensity distributions in K-space. So we have the area detectors. We scan all these uh, diffuse intensities very nicely with the big area detector, and we have the information in, in our computer, and then we have all the simulation packages that, that we can use, and we can actually figure something out. Um, and I cannot go through all this because it's, it's hard, but I want to show you this kind of, uh, let's say, this basic idea, because I think it can be applied not only to this case, but also to many other layered materials. So it's a, it's a nice approach, and it works uh, like this. Uh, the first step here, you start with the analysis of the sharp rack peaks. So we kind of just look at the sharp stuff and we forget about the uh, diffuse scattering. And then you get, of course, limited information because I'm throwing away some of the peaks. Yeah? So my information is limited and I don't get everything, but I get something. <laughs> and uh, so what, what it turns out is that you can, in, in principle, from this already determine a certain average structure which is not quite right, but it's an average structure. From this structure, we can then uh, come to a model. And this model is not well defined because we are still missing information from the other black peaks that we have measured. And we lost a little bit of information. And uh, for instance, here, this is an example. There's one shift of a chlorine position that we cannot determine with this kind of approach where we just look at the black peaks. Uh, there's one variable in this, uh, in this problem that we can't fix. Um, and in order to fix this one, you do the second step. And the second step is to really analyze the diffuse scattering. So now you take everything together. So you start out with this starting model. From this, you start to construct a model that describes the coherent break peaks plus the diffuse scattering. So you do it stepwise. And uh, just to give you a flavor, so um, here you see uh, um, these lines. 
Uh, so these are L scans, very long L scans, uh, and then the intensity as a function of L. And you see they're all measured in this symmetry uh, in this phase at 1.2 GPA. And uh, you see um, these lines, and the different colors are different. And uh, so these colors, I hope you can read this, are calculations for different shifts of the chlorine position. Yeah? So I should shift in our model. Um, the chlorine position a little bit. And when you do this, the, the calculated intensity profile changes a lot yeah, in certain regions. And that, that just tells us that uh, we have a good sensitivity to this coordinate because the diffuse scattering really depends on where this chlorine is sitting. Yeah? And then we just compare these uh, calculations to our data. Yeah? So these are the points here are the data points. And you see the red line, I think, or what is it? My, yeah, probably the red one fits quite nicely. And then from this comparison, we can really tell what is this position. Um, so that is how it worked. So we have we, we, we construct some kind of a, a wrong model from the black peaks. And then from this model, we construct another model, which takes into account everything, including the diffuse scattering. And that works. And what came out? So um, sorry, this is a big table, but I want just to focus on this. Um, this is experiment. And this was the first time I think that we did this. So we wanted to cross check if that is correct. So we uh, compared our experimental fractional coordinates. So these coordinates that you see here tell us where are the atoms in the unit cell? Yeah? Uh, where are they sitting? And we get these kind of coordinates. And you see these are the ones which are a bit difficult. And we compared this to a DFT calculation where we do a structural relaxation. And the nice thing is when we do this DFT calculation, uh, we find essentially really precisely what we get in experiment. So we are uh, confident that this is a good model. You never know, you know, modeling data, but uh, we are quite confident that this is a very good model for the structure, very close to the real situation. And um, you can think of this like it's a, it's a rhombohedral structure with a lot of stacking faults. That's actually what it means. And the interesting, um, Unit in that structure are, of course, the rosinium chlorine trilayers. That's the interesting part. And we want to see what is the structure of this. So it's hard to see from this table, but I have it here for you again. So we, we start here at ambient pressure. This is the stuff I was talking about in the introduction. It's distorted. It has these uh, strange angles. And then at uh, 1.26 GPA, where we have the other phase, uh, this uh, layers, they have a trigonal symmetry. So uh, that implies that the bond lengths of the, in the honeycomb lattice are all the same, and the bond angle is closer to 90. And there's still a distortion of the lattice. So it's, not, it's still not totally perfect, but it's closer. And you see here in the stacking, so the stacking of these layers has changed from this configuration to this configuration. That's what we get from this analysis. And uh, it's closer to ideal, but it's not yet precisely what you want. Yeah? So the, Q, the, the octahedra are not cubic, the bond angle is not 90. And then the big question is, of course, what does this mean for uh, the magnetism? Is that interesting uh, for the magnetism or not? And um, then uh, that's, that's when we, we got in touch with our uh, colleagues here in theory. And I have here, there's another preprint. If you want to know the details, you can look at this also, um, where they try to analyze um, what's going on in the structure. So they took this structure and then did uh, quantum chemistry. And now uh, I hope it doesn't get too embarrassing, but I'm, I'm kind of uh, trying to explain to you what the quantum chemistry is. <laughs> uh, so I do this very shortly because I want to show you many things and I'm uh, running out of time. So the idea is um, we start first, we start out with a local cluster. So there's a local cluster, uh, which is the octahedra made of ruthenium and fluorine. And then, uh, it's in a, a cubic crystal field. So we have the splitting I was talking about earlier, EG and T2G. And now we have a certain number of electrons. In our case, five, we have five electrons. And now I have all possible configurations of these five electrons in these orbitals. I put them in, uh, so they, they actually put them in, look at many different com possible configurations. And then they optimize um, not only say uh, the energies and, and, and the coefficients of the slate are determined, but they also, oh, sorry, I forgot the embedding. So, and then this thing, of course, is embedded in a bigger structure in certain ways. And I, I skip a little bit all the details, but that's kind of representing the surrounding. Yeah? So it's not just a local picture, but it's also embedded into a periodic mm -hmm. lattice, some sense. And uh, so what happens is here, 
We have no charge transfer. So we have this cluster sitting in the middle. There's no charge hopping onto the cluster and there's no charge hopping away from the cluster. So that's fixed. Um, that's the approximation first at this point. And then um, the wave functions are optimized which go into the slater determinants and we also optimize or they also optimize the coefficients of the slater determinants uh, which go into the eigenfunctions of your problem that you want. So in the end, you keep all the many body interactions in, uh, on this cluster and you try to get a good approximation for the wave functions and the energies using this kind of approach. And that's called a complete active space calculation. Okay, that's an approximation. The next step, one of the next steps is to do uh, multi-reference configuration interaction calculation. And uh, this is now a bit different. Now you take the orbitals that we have uh, determined in the first step and uh, you use them to construct uh, here these states. And now, but you say, okay, I have, um, I have a T2, T2G shell here and now they allow for changes uh, of the electron number in these in the T2G shell. So that means uh, electrons can hop from the T2Gs into empty EG levels, or they can help into other higher energy PDS states, or the chlorine can hop into the T2G. So you have charge transfer type excitation. So now charges can move onto the cluster and away from the cluster. Yeah? And in this way, you get corrections and correlations eff effects that are not contained in the previous complete active state calculation. So that's mostly the idea. Um, good. So uh, I think what is interesting now is what, what came out here. So they, they took the structure, that's our structure. They do the calculation and uh, let me just put another, another red box. So let's just look at this one, this box here. Um, this is symmetry. This is a configuration where you have five electrons in the T2G shell or one hole in the T2G shell. And um, every number represents one Kramer's duplet. So that means two states at once. And uh, what you find is that in the complete active space, self consistent field, but complete active space here, there's essentially no splitting of the T2G levels, even though there is a distortion in our structure. Uh, so that is actually uh, a bit surprising at first. Uh, you can go to the multi reference uh, thing and uh, you see it remains that way. And then if you do the multi reference plus the spin orbit coupling, then you have here the J one half state, and here you have uh, the Kramers doublets uh, belonging to the J three half state, and you see the spin orbit coupling of uh, 200 millivolts or so. Yeah? And you immediately see that the spin orbit coupling is much larger than uh, the crystal field splitting of just 10 millivolts or something like this. Yeah? So that is good because that means that we form these J one half states. This is a very good news. Yeah? Um, and then you have all other kind of things that you can look at, and uh, yeah. This is good. So we have a very good, very nicely formed J1 half. We can expect, we can expect a very nice J1 half state as we would need it for the key types of the case. Okay, so uh, what was next? Um, ah, here you see this again. So that's the main uh, outcome of this. And uh, it actually, uh, I think you uh, think that this has to do with the cancellation of local and non-local crystal field effects. Yeah? So that's why we have a distortion of the octahedra, but yet a very small crystal field splitting. Okay, next step is uh, to now look at, uh, at, at exchange interactions or couplings, magnetic couplings in, in such a cluster. So then now it gets more involved because now you have two sites and two clusters sharing an edge. I mean, so two ruthenium octahedra sharing an edge. Um, and uh, because my time is not so, I don't have so much time, I, I just tell you the result. So the result here is actually uh, quite interesting. So what you get is, uh, first of all, you can uh, do a mapping of, of, uh, of the energies onto an effective Hamiltonian, which contains this pseudo spin. That's essentially what I showed in the introduction already. Heisenberg, Kital, and the off diagonal ones. And now let's look what these different calculations give. So one calculation is a CAS calculation, complete active space. Um, but in this case, only with T to G5, T to G5. So that means there's no hopping at all between these two ruthenium sites for charge transfer. Yeah? So that has been switched off artificially uh, in theory. You can do this in the model. So it's gone. So there's no super exchange. And the interesting thing is that you get a Kital interaction already of 1.75 minus 1.75 millivolts. There's a J and there are gammas, even without any hopping of charge. So that already tells you that the super exchange picture is kind of incomplete. Something in this model is there, which we haven't considered so far. So then 
you do something else, you add, let's say, different configurations. You have DB hopping, mostly in this case. So charges can move from one Rosinum to the other, but not from the chloride to the Rosinum and so on. So just DB mod type excitations. Um, it doesn't change much for the T type, interestingly. A little, of course, for the J, which is the Heisenberg. And then you have the gamma terms. And then if you do the full thing where you have the super exchange plus the stuff that we don't yet know precisely what it is, say, yeah, since we have an idea, of course, but uh, let's say uh, then, then you do the full thing with all the charge transfer, multi reference calculation, then you see, okay, the guitar interaction changes yeah, significantly, but you know, it's just twice as much as we already had before. As uh, J goes away, this is very uh, interesting. And uh, you have the gamma and um, the gamma prime type term. So uh, I, I, I think uh, what, you, what you immediately learn then from this is that there's a very large contribution to the uh, Kitalf exchange and the gamma prime, prime without any super exchange process. And uh, also we have a vanishing Heisenberg interaction, even though the bond angle is not 90 degree. Uh, so there's something you can hardly understand uh, with a super exchange model. So what's going on? And I have a very poor man's uh, slide here. So to explain this, so if you think back uh, at, to the Heidler London uh, approximation of a, of, a, of a hydrogen two molecule, yeah? so you have fermions. So the wave function, which is the orbital part times the spin part in total must be anti-symmetric with respect to particle exchange. Okay, and here you see now, uh, I can construct different orbital parts, symmetric or anti-symmetric. Here the electron one is at side A, electron two is at side B. Here it's the other way around, electron two is at side A and electron one is at side B. And I can have these two combinations with different sides here, yeah, with plus or minus. One is symmetric and one is anti-symmetric with respect to particle exchange. Um, and that means because the total wave function has to be anti-symmetric, if this is symmetric, then the spin part has to be anti-symmetric. And that means this is consistent with the singlet. Or if this is uh, here anti-symmetric, uh, anti no, so symmetric, then uh, the spin part has to be anti-symmetric. And the other way around. I hope I didn't. I sense this right now. Okay. Um, so that means the orbital part somehow is related to the spin of the, of the two. And uh, so then you can just calculate what is the Coulomb energy Coulomb interaction between these two electrons, and you can immediately imagine that this is uh, this, these are two different spatial distributions of the electrons, and certainly the Coulomb interaction between the two electrons will be different, and that's what you get quite straightforwardly. Here, there's an additional term which reflects the plus and the minus from here, and um, it's the exchange term, and that's called the Coulomb, Coulomb exchange or direct exchange because there's no charge shopping. It's just an exchange term because you have a certain symmetry of the orbital wave function. So it's something that's in the structure of the wave function. Not, doesn't involve hopping. So that's what, that's my understanding. Good. So, and we, uh, so the idea is that this is what happens in, this, in, in the Rosinium trichloride as well. So we have the Coulomb exchange, which is important. So, um, or direct exchange. Now then the next question would be, okay, now what is the Hamiltonian? So the Hamiltonian looks like this uh, here. Yeah, so we are missing the J, but we have the anisotropic part. And as I said in the very beginning, when you have anisotropic exchange interactions it actually helps for the quantum spin liquid to emerge. Uh, the Heisenberg is bad, the anisotropic stuff can help. Um, and I think I tried to calculate where we are in this phase diagram. I think Satoshi calculated the phase diagram um, for different coupling strengths here. Um, and I think we are somehow here. But the thing is that this Hamiltonian, uh, this one, has a lot of quantum spin liquids. It has, of course, a Kitaev type quantum spin liquid. It has a quantum spin liquid one and a quantum spin liquid two. But it's, uh, it's a system that is very likely to have a quantum spin liquid state. That's the statement. OK. So now, OK, this is fine. And uh, now you can argue, you can say, okay, well, uh, you have uh, done this at room temperature, so who cares? We want to have a quantum spin liquid at low temperatures. And also, what use is a quantum spin liquid in a diamond anvil cell? I cannot make a quantum computer with an inside diamond anvil cell. That's totally impossible. Uh, so uh, you can wonder about this. And uh, one nice experiment that actually Quirin did is uh, we did the uh, following. So we have you know, the diamonds, and we took a crystal, and we just put it onto the diamond without gluing it down was just sitting there. And then we cool it down. Uh, this is this measurement. 
there's no stress. <laughs> so uh, very relaxed measurement. So we go from 300, does cool down to three. And you see here again, one of these streaks and there's not much going on. So that means that the system remains in this monoclinic phase, just sits in the monoclinic phase and doesn't change. The other experiment was uh, we took the sample and we glued it very firmly onto an aluminum holder. Well, everybody does, I think, many people. Do. Now you have a different uh, thermal contraction of the sample and the aluminum, and that results in a biaxial strain on your sample. And when you do this and you cool down, unfortunately, you could only do this in our lab uh, down to 90 at the time, but you see the peaks, they shift. Now these peaks change. And that is actually uh, signaling that we again go into this higher symmetry phase because we applied the strain. Um, so that means it's really easy to stabilize this, this phase. You don't need a diamond ampule cell. You can actually use a, a, an aluminum holder to stabilize it. And I think this is very nice because now uh, many people can study this with their, with their methods, or maybe they already have and they just didn't know. So um, the idea is here, you know, I try to draw this. You have your sample holder here, you pull it down, and then there's naturally some kind of biaxial strain appearing, and it kind of switches the structure into the higher symmetry uh, situation for the honeycomb layers. And um, then you have it sitting there, and now you can work with it and measure it with all kinds of transport also. So it's accessible to a broad range of uh, low temperatures experiment, low temperature experiments. Um, yeah, so this is already a summary here. So the quantum chemistry uh, for this high symmetry phase shows that this is really a phase that is very likely to host a quantum spin liquid. It has the highest K over J value ever reported as far as I remember. And you have these very nice J one half states um, according to these uh, uh, calculations. And the other thing is, that um, the Coulomb exchange is important. And that's something that's relevant if you are looking for new materials. Yeah? So we don't have to focus so much on these precisely 90 degrees uh, of bonding angle, and it must not necessarily be precisely uh, cubic and so on. So it might help. And uh, yeah, that you have this direct Coulomb exchange, then I realized we have already seen this in the earlier study because you see there was this dimerization. So there is a strong interaction between these neighboring orbitals directly. So it's actually kind of we intuitively feel that we have the Coulomb exchange. Okay, so do I have time or should I stop? I have one more I will short example. Okay. Five well, minutes? Please. Five minutes. I can do it, I think, in five minutes. So the, the interaction we, we wanted to get here was the Coulomb exchange, and I think that's, that's nice. It's something we learned by combining theory and, uh, and, uh, and diffraction. Now, the thing was I wanted to say a little bit about what happens if you have intolerant electrons on a frustrated lattice. So electrons can hop around maybe very quickly. Uh, so the iridium telluride, D-telluride is such a system. Now it has a triangular layer. And um, maybe I, I kind of skip this. The thing is, in these systems, you have a very similar approach. I was telling you about how we go about this. Yeah? So you have bonding, anti-bonding states. Uh, you have a crystal field splitting. Then you do your spin orbit coupling and you create spin orbit coupled states. And then you try to see how these states now disperse in K-space because this is metallic phase. Yeah? We have to worry about dispersions. And then you get crossing. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm very fast. If you, if you like to, now how that works is actually pretty, pretty generic. So in the uh, tellurium P manifold, you can get these kind of things. It's very nicely explained in this paper. And here, for example, you see there's one uh, certain states, I call it R for, R for minus, it's derived from a PZ state. And along the C direction, it has a strong dispersion. And then there is a protected uh, crossing point by symmetry. Um, the Dirac point tilted one, and you have this anti crossings and stuff like this. So you have uh, topological surface states that have been observed and so on. So it's an interesting. So what I'm what I want to say is interesting. So there are interesting things going on in these systems. Um, the, the thing what we did is there is a competing again, it's a little similar. So there was a competing instability. So the system shows superconductivity and so on, but there was a competing instability, and that was a dimerization again. So there was again this dimerization under pressure. And uh, so we, uh, at the time, set out to understand what is this dimerization precisely. And um, we did a refinement. So that's possible. You can do this in a pressure cell. So under pressure, as a function of pressure. And we found these dimers here. So this is iridium. This is uh, tellurium. And this is iridium again. And you see here, there's a 90 degree bond angle. And not close to 90 degree bond angle. 
all uh, uh, connecting these, these two iridium sites. And the important thing here was this, um, maybe this. So from the, when you are at ambient pressure, this bond angle alpha is above 90 degree. And then you apply pressure and suddenly it really drops very dramatically to, to 70 something and it goes below 70 with pressure. So that's a very, very strong uh, response of the lattice. And it's really surprising. It was the first time that I saw that the super, so-called super lattice peak was stronger than the black peak sometimes, or as strong, it was really funny. Um, okay, that's just, you know, characterizing the stuff. So what can we learn from this? And what we can learn from this is interesting. Um, and this is my last slide, I think. Uh, so the idea that we have is that, again, you have this 90, kind of 90 de degree bonding situations as in, in the resilient trichloride, but this time the bonding is different. So there's a strong bonding between the uh, iridium B and the tellurium P levels, and they form an orbital, an, sorry, a molecular orbital, if you like. And we realized that if you have two neighboring of these two neighboring orbitals on this side and on this side, and the bond is very close to 90 degree, the overlap between these two orbitals is very small. So if it's 90, the overlap is small. But then if you start uh, kind of tilting away from 90, you create an overlap because now these molecular orbitals are no longer orthogonal. They become more and more parallel. So you get a very strong hybridization increase. And that results in a in a formation of strongly bonding and strongly anti-bonding states. Now, this is a cartoon, but you find this in DFT as well. So it's very strongly stabilizing a bonding state. So you can imagine that this kind of mechanism um, creates a very strange electron phonon coupling, because if you have a phonon that's kind of uh, affecting this bond angle, you really change the bonding or the energy landscape for the electrons. You form a very strong bonding state when you start playing around with this angle. It's a little bit, you know, you know, like a symmetry breaking, and it reminds me of the Antella effect, but uh, in a different way. So now it's related to a bond angle. Um, yeah, that's what we find out in this case. So it's a very unusual and very strong electron phonon coupling. And I could imagine that happens in other systems as well, which have this kind of 90 degree bonding situation. Good. So that was everything. Uh, here's my summary again. Um, I don't need to go through this uh, in detail again, just for you to be reminded. And I uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.